En ik laat Julie ook binnen als het... Hij is binnen, ja, papa. Ja, 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 ja. Maar er gebeurt nou allemaal dingen die, die niet... Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Voor mij is het nog good morning. Good afternoon. Good, good morning, good afternoon and good day. Voor je is good morning, bij ons is het 12 o'clock. Yes. Welkom. Je hele familie is daar. Nou, een part of your family is daar, I see. Wow. Wow, thank you very, very much. Hello, everybody. Hello. Start, wow, so nice to see. So nice to see some family members here. Thank you very, very much. Um, when would you like me to start? So should we start now? Should we wait a minute? No, you can start. Okay. Thank you very, very much for inviting me uh, to share some ideas with you in this run-up to, to, to Shavuot. It's a great privilege uh, for me to join your wonderful program. A special thanks uh, to Mr. Um, Mr. Uh, Paul Jacobs for inviting me um, to be a part of this. Thank you. Um, and um, I have a great family connection with Holland. Uh, so many of my family, the Tugentaft family, um, lived in Holland, Amsterdam, Rotterdam um, through the years. And it's been a, a wonderful host um, for all of these Tugentafts, Baruch Hashem. And of course, my wife um, is the daughter of uh, Fia Evers, uh, Fia Kimchi. Um, so, of course, uh, Bluma Evers, Zechreina Livrocha, was the matriarch um, of the family. And of course, <laughs> And of course, she was a very, uh, a very uh, beloved person in the Dutch community. So <clears throat> thank you very, very much for um, inviting me. Now, the topic that I want to do today is a most unusual topic and is a topic which is not <clears throat> spoken about um, too often. And that is the topic of reincarnation, the idea <clears throat> that um, people claim that after a person leaves this world, their soul lives on and sometimes comes back um, uh, into, another, into another body. Um, so is this a Jewish, is this a Jewish um, concept? Um, so, um, so this is known very, very much um, in the non-Jewish world. This is known in, um, in Buddhism, in many of the Eastern religions. There is this concept of reincarnation. But is this a Jewish idea? <clears throat> and that is the topic that I would like to discuss this morning. It's actually very topical because yesterday there was a study which came out, somebody sent me, it was reported in yesterday's um, newspapers um, that there is a scientist and this scientist um, is somebody who has done a lot of research <clears throat> regarding this um, and um, um, his name um, is Dr. Ian Stevenson former professor of psychiatry at the University of Virginia School of Medicine, the former chair of the Department of Psychiatry and Neurology. And he has done many, many studies um, on this, looking among other things at birthmarks and birth defects, um, which correspond to wounds um, on deceased people and on uh, children who claim to remem remember uh, previous lifetimes. Um, and he has done a lot of research on this, and he has um, uh, produced a number of papers, um, and, uh, and he has quite a lot of what he believes is very strong evidence um, for reincarnation. Um, and um, I would like to highlight one posuk in Megillas Rus, and um, I'd like to um, uh, focus on that, 
and hopefully um, go through a number of sources with you and Be'ezra Sashem discuss this unusual uh, topic. So the first um, source <clears throat> is, um, is in the fourth chapter of the book of Rus, where um, let, and let us remind ourselves of what has been going on uh, over here in the, in the book of Rus. Um, we have that um, there was a, a, a man called Machloin, and he um, had a brother, Kilion, and they went out, they left Israel, and they married Moabite women, um, Rus and Orpah. And um, we are told that um, Machloin and Kilion, they died. And after, um, after they died, Rus was all by herself, but she had her mother-in-law. Her mother-in-law's name was Naomi. Rus and Naomi are very, very popular uh, Jewish names, Ruth and Naomi, and, um, and there are many, many Ruths and Naomi's that we know, all, of course, sourced uh, in this book of Megillas Rus. Now, Ruth did not leave her mother-in-law, Naomi, and she was very devoted and dedicated to her. And they came back to Eretz Yisrael, and there uh, they were incredibly poor. There was unbelievable poverty. And there was a family member um, that, uh, that Naomi's husband had. And of course, his name was Boaz. He was a cousin of Elimelech, of the husband of Naomi, the mother-in-law of Ruth. And uh, ultimately, we know the story that Rus ended up doing something called Yibum, marrying her, her deceased husband's distant relative, Boaz, and she had a child with Boaz. And what's very important Come on. is that this child, his name was Oved, and he had a child called Yeshai, who had a son called David, which is, of course, a wonderful name. <laughs> um, and um, and uh, and of course, <laughs> of David Hamelach. If I could just trouble the host, <laughs> everybody, please, Let's just trouble the host <laughs> to mute everybody. <laughs> is that okay? Is the host managed to mute mute everybody? Thank you so much. So um, so uh, they had a child, Boyaz and Rus, yeah, okay. and Rus. They had a child, and uh, that would be the ancestor of the Davidic dynasty. Beautiful. Here was a story of rags to riches. This girl, Rus, who originally, indeed, had actually been a Moabite princess. <clears throat> she ended up losing her husband, Machloin. She ended up having no money whatsoever. And, uh, and, she, and then she married Boyaz, this great Torah leader. And she had this child who would be the ancestor of Moshiach. Beautiful. Now, let's have a look for a moment um, at Ruth chapter four, and I'm going to uh, share my screen uh, over here, and we will see that in Ruth chapter four, there's a line which I think is worthy of um, analysis. In Ruth chapter four, Vatikach Nomi es hayeled Nomi, the mother-in-law of Ruth, took this child. Vatishi seyu b'cheka, she held it to her chest. Vatiloila imenes, and she looked after it. And the neighbors um, um, called out, shame, lamer, a name to this child. And she said, Yulad ben Lenomi, a child has been born to Nomi. And they named him Oveit, who Avi Yishai, Avi David, the father of Yishai, the father of David, who would become King David, who the whole world would know about. Now, the words that I'd like to zero in on over here are these three words, Yulad ben le Naomi. A child has been born to Naomi. A child has been born to Naomi. Poor Naomi, who'd lost her husband Elimelech and lost her son Machlein and lost her son Chilion. And she had this devoted daughter-in-law, Rus. Rus has now had a child. A child has been born to Naomi. Now, of course, the very great question over here is that actually this child was not a blood relative of Naomi at all. This child was the child of Rus and the child of Boyaz. Rus was a daughter-in-law who was not related. She was not a blood relative of Naomi. This child, Oved, was not related 
to Naomi through Rus, and she was not related through Boaz. Boaz was a distant relative. So how can we say Yulad Ben le Naomi? A child has been born to Naomi. So one could give a simple answer, and one could say, well, it's not literal. It doesn't mean literally that a child has been born to Naomi. Rather, it's like metaphorical, because Naomi would be this elderly lady in the house who, as we saw, she would be fostering, looking after this child. She would be like a nanny to this child. So therefore, we say a child has been born to Naomi. It's not a real child. It's just metaphorical. It's not literal. She was just like this kind-hearted person who would be in the house. And it is like a child has been born to her. But if we want to be literalists over here, it says a child has been born to Naomi. And the child had not been born to Naomi. How are we supposed to understand this posuk that a child had been born to Naomi? And what I'm going to be doing today, but Ezra Sashem, is looking at Torah sources <coughs> that discuss reincarnation and to wonder whether this child that will be born that was born to Rus, whether it is possible to say that this is actually the reincarnated child that Naomi originally had her child Machaloin, who had died, is this child that had been born to Rus, is this really the reincarnation of the very same child that was born to Naomi? So let us have a look at some sources which, um, which discuss this. And I'd like to share with you over here um, some uh, sources from um, Rabbi Ullman. Uh, Rabbi Yirmiyo Ullman is a Torah teacher um, in Yerushalayim, and he has prepared lots of sources on reincarnation and just it's easier to um, look at these sources together and discuss them. And then we're just going to be using this um, to, um, and then we're going to look back to our discussion on the book of Rus. Okay, so the first source that we have over here is the Zohar in Parshish Mishpotim. We just had. Um, uh, Lag um this week and uh, last week. And uh, of course, Lag Omer is the celebration of the reincarnation of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, the author of the Zohar HaKodesh, the book of Jewish mysticism and spirituality. So it says in the Zohar HaKodesh, in Parshish Mishpotim, we know it says, Ve'ele ha-mishpotim asher tosim lifneihem. These are the mishpotim, the mishpotim, the judgments which you shall set before you. Now, the judgments over here, the simple explanation of the judgments <coughs> is that this is the laws, the normal halachis, the monetary laws that we have, which are in the book called Cheshen Mishpot, the part of the Shulchan Aruch called Cheshen Mishpot. But the Zohar says that actually there's another explanation these are the judgments which you shall set before them, meaning these are the dinot, the tisader, kadmeyan, the sidron, the gilgulo. These are the rules concerning reincarnation. And that there is an idea that sometimes a person will be reincarnated. And these are the mishpotim that are being spoken about over here. Now, why is it that it is particularly over here when it comes to business laws that we have the allusion to reincarnation. So um, the answer is given based on a story of the Baal Shem Tov. The story goes that, and, and uh, you know, with stories of the Baal Shem Tov, um, there is an idea, are we supposed to be naive and believe all of the stories that are said about the Baal Shem Tov? So we say that if a person believes all of them, they're naive. If they believe none of them, then they're a non-believer. There's somewhere in the middle uh, over there. But I'll tell you the story. And the story serves um, to illustrate um, the, the answer to this question. Why is it that the, that the idea of reincarnation is particularly alluded to uh, in Parshas Mishpotim, which speaks about monetary law? There is a story that is told of the holy Baal Shem Tov that somebody came to him and said, I just don't understand why it is that bad things happen to good people. And he said to him, you know, you're saying a very important um, point. And what I want you to do is I want you to go to a certain 
tree in a certain forest. You have to climb this tree and you're not allowed to intervene. Whatever happens, you're not allowed to intervene. So he said, okay, you want me to climb a tree? I'm asking you a philosophical question, a deep question. And, and you're telling me to climb a tree and to just see what's going on. Okay, that's what I'll do. So he climbed the tree and he saw early in the morning, <clears throat> there was a soldier who came by who was very exhausted from his, uh, from his tiring journey. And he sat down under the tree and he was exhausted. He lay his head on the roots of the tree and he promptly fell asleep. After some time, he woke up and he realized he'd been sleeping for too long. He quickly jumped back on his horse and he rode off. And uh, the person who was uh, in the tree noticed, oh my goodness, he left his purse behind. And he wanted to call out, hey, you left your wallet. But the Baal Shem Tov had told him, you're not allowed to intervene whatsoever. It was difficult for him because he naturally wanted to call it out. But those were the terms and conditions of his day in the tree, so he couldn't intervene. A little bit later, a young boy came over and walked past the tree and was happily skipping and playing. He noticed um, this uh, purse full of coins on the floor. He looked at the purse. He looked to his right. He looked to his left. He couldn't see anybody who had left it there. He shrugged his shoulders. He bent down and picked up the purse and happily skipped on. Wonderful, he'd managed to get this, this purse. Then later on in the day, there was a very haggard um, pauper who came along, somebody who looked as though he was a homeless person. And um, he, he came along and he was uh, happily, you know, well, not so happily, but he was walking past and um, he was exhausted. So what he did was he uh, lay down at the bottom of the tree. He was so exhausted and he fell asleep. And then from the distance, the person who was in the top of the tree, they saw that the soldier was riding from the distance, was galloping to come closer and closer and closer to this tree. And the soldier comes to the tree and he dismounts from his horse. And he sees this beggar lying there on the floor. And he says, hey, you, where's my money? The beggar wakes up with a start, doesn't know what's going on. He says, yes, you, where's my money? The beggar shrugs his shoulders. I, I don't know what you're talking about. So the soldier kicks him and he says, give me back my money. The beggar says, I'm begging you, leave me alone. I don't know what's going on. And the soldier slaps him rips his jacket off, checks it, all of his pockets, and then pushes him down and says, oh, I don't know what's going on over here. And, and, and he runs off. And the person in the tree was crestfallen. He was heartbroken to see this misjustice, how this beggar had been treated so badly. So he would have liked to have intervened, but he didn't fancy his chances with the soldier anyway. And uh, later on, at the end of the day, he went back to the Baal Shem Tov. He said, Rebbe, I asked you to explain why bad things happen to good people. You just made my questions even more. And before he had a chance to tell him um, what had transpired that day, the Baal Shem Tov says, listen, I want you to know what happened many years ago. Many years ago, there was a person who was owed money by somebody else. And they went to court because he hadn't paid back the money that he owed him. And somehow he managed to pull a fast one and he lied and he managed to get away without paying back the money that he really owed. That's what happened many years ago. But it was not allowed that this injustice should be allowed to be perpetuated, to continue. So the person in the previous lifetime who lost his money, he was reincarnated and that is the young boy who you saw. And he, in this world, was able to get his money back. The soldier who you saw, who lost his money in this world, he was the person in the previous lifetime who had lied and who had managed to get the money which he was undeserving of. And it was not just that he should be able to get this money, which 
did not really belong to him. So he had to be reincarnated back in order to lose the money which he had stolen in a previous lifetime and to get it back to its original owner. So then the man said, but Rebbe, who was the beggar? He said, that was the Dayan. And he wasn't, he wasn't careful that day. And he was a bit, uh, he wasn't thinking it through correctly because he should have been able to pick it up and he didn't. And therefore, even though he was good in the previous world, he had to come back to undergo certain suffering in order to be able to right that wrong. This is the legend of this story. Whether it's true or not, I can't tell you. But of course, we have a Muna that, uh, that such a thing could happen. And um, I'm just using it to illustrate why it is that the topic of reincarnation is brought in the Zahara Kodesh, particularly when it comes to monetary laws that we find the illusion, the source of reincarnation, because this is one of the reasons why it is that sometimes people have to be reincarnated. Okay, so, so far we have seen that sometimes um, the, the Zohar has told us um, that there is such a thing as reincarnation. And I've just explained why it is that sometimes, um, uh, why that is connected particularly um, to monetary laws. Let us have a look at a few more sources um, of reincarnation before we um, um, discuss it uh, in, uh, in, greater, in greater detail. Uh, Rabbi Ullman, he brings um, a source from Unculus. We know that Unculus um, is one of the um, is one of the earliest uh, commentaries uh, on the Torah, the Targum Unculus. And in Parshas Vayachi, he is discussing the bracha which Yaakov Avinu gives to his son Reuven. It says Yachi Reuven va'aliomus. Sorry, this is in Parshas Vezeis Habracha. Uh, which we all lane on Simchas Torah. Please God, we will be able to hear laning again soon. I look forward to the day we hear laning again soon. Um, I don't know in Holland if you have resumed any of your services yet. Um, here in England, um, the doctors and uh, have allowed to have um, some small outdoor services under certain conditions. But please God, we will all go back to hear Kriyasa Torah, the laning again soon. So this is a posuk in Vezeis Habracha. Yechi Ruvein va'aliomus, let Ruvein live and not die. And Unculus says he should not have to die a second time. It's enough he has died once in this world. He should not have to die a second time. And, um, and meaning that, please God, Ruvein, he should, um, he should live in the world to come and he shouldn't have to come back down to this world to live, to, to live another life and then die again. So we've so far seen um, the great Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, the Tana, the uh, author of the, one of the authors in the Mishnah and the author of the Zohar discussing reincarnation. We've seen Unculus discussing reincarnation. Um, <clears throat> there is um, a um, Unculus, the Targum says it again in Isaiah and Yeshaya 22 and 65. Um, another source is the Ramban, Nachmanides. Now, the Ramban, a very classic one of the Roshanim, one of the medieval commentators, he says on the book of Eoiv, the book of Job, one of the most difficult books that there is in Tanakh to understand the book of Job is when um, Eoiv, he has so much suffering in his life and he cannot understand why there is such suffering. And as one goes through the book of Job, a certain sense, he first loses his faith and then he finds his faith again. And at the end of the book, then everything goes well. In the middle of the book, it's very, very difficult um, experiences um, which uh, Eoiv Job has. And even his approach is uh, many things in the book of Job um, were things that he had um, said on his journey um, towards uh, uh, acceptance of his difficult plight. Um, so it says over there, there's a posak in, in Job in Eoiv 33, Behold, God does all these two or three times with a person. To bring back his soul. From the pit, to, meaning to come back from where he has been placed. 
um, to be enlightened with the light of life. And the Ramban says that this is another expression of reincarnation, that it could be that sometimes a person has to come back in this world and they have a degree of difficulty and that is based on things that had happened to them in a previous lifetime. We see also the Chofetz Chaim, the great um, uh, Rabbon Shel Kol B'nei Yisrael, the great Torah leader uh, before the Second World War, the immortal Chofetz Chaim, the author of the Mishnah Brura, and uh, the book, the Chofetz Chaim, of Yisrael Meir of Radin, <coughs> in his book, Safas Tomim, um, he also speaks about reincarnation. So we have a number of very, very significant sources which discuss, <coughs> from a Torah perspective, uh, this idea of reincarnation. Now, I have to tell you that there is a minority opinion called Rav Sadia Goyen. Rav Sadia Goyen, in his book, Amunos Videos, he disputes reincarnation. He is a later uh, commentator after well, he's uh, after the Gomorrah, certainly, um, but, um, uh, but before the Rishonim, and he um, um, uh, disagrees with the concept of reincarnation, um, and there are one or two other um, Acharonim, a minority sources, um, that say that there is no such thing as reincarnation. Um, however, um, they are they're, they're, they are not as authoritative as the sources that we brought beforehand. Um, when you have um, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, um, and when you have other uh, Rishonim that discuss this, and more that we'll see, and Unculus, um, so they are less authoritative. Um, it, some say that Rav Sajigoyen may not have been aware of reincarnation in the Jewish tradition, because in his time, the Kabbalah was very hidden. Um, others say maybe he was aware of it, but was just um, wanted to discourage people uh, from emphasizing it. So, um, so this is the idea of reincarnation. So far, we have seen that um, this is, uh, according to the overwhelming majority uh, of Torah sources, a Jewish concept. Okay, now let's discuss why it is that there is um, reincarnation. Why should it be that Hashem has made the world um, with such um, a, uh, a mechanism. So there are four reasons for reincarnation given by Rabbi Chaim Vital, the great Kabbalist, the primary student um, of, um, of the Arizal, the famous Ari, the master um, of, uh, of Kabbalah, who lived in Safas in the 1500s. So his primary student, Rabbi Chaim Vital, writes in Shar HaGilgulim, which is a Kabbalistic work which he authored all about reincarnation in the introductory chapters. He says there are four reasons why there might be reincarnation. <clears throat> Number one is sometimes it's to repair damage that we did to our neshama, to our soul. We know that a human being is a body and a soul. Um, we, have a, we have physicality, flesh and blood um, and, uh, and bones and hair and cartilage, but as well as being a body, we are also a soul. We are also a neshama, a spark of godliness that Hashem has put inside of us. Um, and sometimes it could be that in a previous life, maybe we did some damage to our neshama through things that we did. We damaged our soul. And therefore, what we need to do is we come back um, to try and fix the damage that we have done. So that is one reason for reincarnation. Um, another, um, and, and the way that we fix that is by avoiding those same pitfalls in our subsequent lifetime. The second reason given for reincarnation is that even if we hadn't done um, damage to our soul in a previous lifetime, it could be that we did not achieve our perfection in a previous lifetime. So therefore, what, we, what happens is we come back again, but this time to try and grow to a higher level and to take advantage of opportunities that we didn't take in our previous um, existence. There are different levels of our the nefesh, the ruach, the neshama, the chaya, yechida. There are five different primary levels of the soul. And we are expected to perfect at least the lowest three levels, says um, Reb Chaim Vital in the Shar HaGulgulim. And if we didn't manage to perfect them the first time round, 
then we're given opportunity to come back and perfect them a second time. Now, the question is, maybe we'll do worse the second time. The answer is that whatever we have already achieved is in the bank. That is banked. So if we manage to achieve um, a perfection of our nefesh, but we haven't done the ruach, then we'll come back a second time. We don't need to work on the nefesh aspect. That is in the bank. This time we're going to have to work on the ruach um, uh, and, uh, and we will um, continue um, to grow. Now, that is <clears throat> the second reason. Um, as a side point, people often ask, when it comes to the resurrection, we believe that the, soul, that the bodies will also be resurrected. Which incarnation will be resurrected? Which one of us will come back? Will it be the Mark I, the Mark II, the Mark III? Which one will it be? So the uh, Kabbalistic sources say that all of them um, will be resurrected. There's a certain primer primacy in the first, um, the first time that we were here, but all of the different um, bodies uh, will be resurrected. So, so far we've seen one reason for reincarnation is to fix damage. The second one is to try and achieve perfection and to grow higher. The third reason might be to perfect others. It could be that we ourselves um, do not need to be perfected, but um, by coming back down in this world, we can perfect others. So um, it could be that um, even though it's difficult to come back down in this world, it could be a big tzaddik allows himself to be reincarnated for the sake and, and, and is willing to forego uh, their spiritual existence in the world to come in order to help others to lift others. And the fourth reason is, again, a big topic in and of itself. And that might be to marry one soulmate, a person. It could be that they missed out on the ideal person that they were supposed to marry the first time around, and therefore they come back to marry their soulmate. Now, it could be the ideal person is someone who will shout at you and scream at you. And um, through that, you will actually be able to become a better person. So the person's soulmate isn't necessarily the person who one has the easiest to marry with. It could be that it's a jolly difficult marriage, but it could be that that was the one who is the primary one. Now, even if a person didn't marry their primary one, still, um, um, we believe that a person is, under most circumstances, able to make a go of it with other um, um, uh, people as well who uh, may not be in the absolute optimum, but are still very, very um, uh, perfect for them. Um, and this is really beyond the topic of this, uh, the idea of soulmates, um, but, um, but that is a fourth reason why it is, why a soul may have to come back. So that is to repair damage, to um, get to higher levels, to fix others, and to marry one's soulmate. Now, this idea- Robert, Can I ask a question, please? Sure. So based on that show we had last night on this channel as well, uh, on Pirka Ovos, where it says that the soul comes clean and therefore returns clean, and that ultimately if there's too many Averas that can't be cleansed by Yom Kippur or by the Teshuvah and all those kind of things, then death is the ultimate cleansing of the, of the soul. Based on those Mishnayas, what you're saying is contradictory to the Mishnah? Excellent, excellent question. This question that you're asking is actually the question of the Rashash. The Rashash is one of the um, Torah uh, commentator, uh, one of the commentators uh, on the Gomorrah. And the um, phrase that you bring um, um, is, well, it, it's also mentioned in Boba Metzia, um, Daf Kuf Zayin. And it says, Borach Ato Bavoyacho, or Borach Ato Batseisecho. Blessed are you when you come into the world, and blessed are you when you depart from the world. And um, and there, the Gomorrah says that just when you came into the world, um, you were clean and you had no Averus. So too, when you leave the world, you should also be clean and have no Averus. When I said that there are minority opinions who disagree with reincarnation, I mentioned Rav Sajir Goin and I mentioned some other Acharonim, some other later commentators. I was actually referring to the Rashash. Um, um, who was not the Kabbalist called the Rashash, but was a commentator uh, on the uh, on the uh, Gomorrah in the in the back of the Vilna edition of the Shas um, uh, are his uh, comments, and he says that the um, point that you brought is a source against um, reincarnation. Now the others they answer the question of the Rashash as follows, and they say that that is a misunderstanding um, of the Gomorrah. When it speaks about you came into the world free of sin, that was 
the first time you came into the world, the first time you came into the world, you were totally free of sin. And the idea is when I leave um, the world in whichever incarnation I am, I should leave the world free of sin. Just like when I came into the world, the first time I came into the world. So that is the answer that they bring um, uh, on the Rashash's question. So thank you so much uh, for mentioning that and uh, allowing me um, to discuss that. Satisfied? Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, now um, let's discuss this um, a little bit, um, a little bit more. Um, do we have any other type of evidence <clears throat> um, of um, of um, this idea of reincarnations? Um, and <clears throat> um, and additionally, this idea of reincarnation. What other things? will this idea help us with? So <clears throat> I don't know if any of you have ever heard of such an idea of um, infants who um, seem to have awareness and knowledge, which is just impossible for them to have been able to have achieved already. Now, of course, every Jewish mother thinks that her child is just Moshiach Tidkenu, is unbelievable, and every Jewish father is proud to the roof. Um, and to, to the sky of their little yingle or maidle, their little child, Kanainahara. But there have been certain um, cases where there were people who came to the world and seemed to know things which are, are incredible and impossible for them to know. Now, <clears throat> there is a Jewish source and a non-Jewish source. The Jewish source is in the book called Nishmas Chaim by Menashe ben Israel. Menashe ben Israel was a famous if I'm not mistaken, Dutch rabbi, maybe you can help me out over here. I think he was a Dutch rabbi who came to live in England and died in 1658 and was very important in convincing Oliver Cromwell to allow the Jews back into England. I believe that Menashe ben Israel was a Dutch rabbi. And um, in his work, Nishmas Chaim, um, he speaks um, um, about um, children who had an awareness and a knowledge that is just impossible, which is inexplicable, impossible to explain. Um, and um, there's a, a story that he brings um, in the Shalsheles HaKabolo, page 46, um, um, written by Rav Gedalia ben Yosef ibn Yahya, who died in 1587. And it says that there was a child called Nachman Katufa living in the 1500s, 1400s, 1500s. And he was, when he was born, as soon as he could speak, he spoke about Masa Merkova. He spoke about Kabbalistic ideas um, from the moment he was able to speak and nobody had taught this to him. And he died um, at, uh, when he was 12 years old, seemingly that he'd already managed to perfect everything he needed to perfect. So this idea of children who are aware of things um, is an astonishing idea. Um, and is something that we see in Jewish sources, um, even if it's just a child prodigy who has unbelievable prowess um, in a certain areas. One normally just says that they are gifted, but possibly one could um, uh, posture, one could suggest that maybe that's because there is some um, uh, knowledge which was already pre-encoded into them from a previous um, lifetime. Take it or leave it. What I will show you, though, is an interesting, um, um, uh, an, uh, a very, very interesting, just sorry, just uh, open this up. Just want to show you something um, over here. Um, does reincarnation exist? Um, so this is taken from a BBC television program, 40 Minutes in 1990. Um, and it says over here, it speaks about a child in India, Titu Singh. And when he was two and a half years old, he began to tell his family of his other life in Agra, a city in Northern India. His memories were quite specific. He said he'd been the owner of a radio, TV and video shop. His name was Suresh Verma. He had a wife named Uma and two children. So this is a child who's speaking about his previous life. He also said he'd been shot, cremated, his ashes thrown into the river. His parents did not take him seriously at first, but eventually his older brother traveled to this place, Agra, and he checked out the claims. He found a video shop called Suresh Radio, run by a widow named Uma, 
whose husband had been shot just as Titu had described. When a visit was arranged, Titu spotted them first. He recognized them immediately, shouted to his parents that his other family had come. They invited the visitors to sit on the veranda. Titu asked Uma to sit near him, an odd way for a five-year-old in India to relate to a grown woman. He asked about the children. He stunned the widow by recounting the details of a family outing to a fair in a neighboring village where Suresh had bought her sweets, information that only he could have known. And he entered the video shop and he identified changes made to the shop since the death in his previous lifetime. Now, there are loads of stories about this, and I'm sure most of them are baloney. They're rubbish and they're, they're complete, complete rubbish. This one, it was quoted on the BBC television news program, 40 Minutes. And as an Englishman, when you see something that comes on the BBC, you know, we're sort of a little bit programmed to believe these things. But I'm just showing you that it was reported. And there are many, many of the scientists who I'd mentioned at the beginning of the Shia, who has done studies um, uh, in this. He has many, many um, examples um, of such things where there are children who seem to know um, uh, things from previous lifetimes, which is uh, inexplicable, impossible to know how they could have understood um, such, uh, such details. So um, I asked, do we have any evidence? We don't have proper evidence, but certainly um, it is very, very thought provoking that we do have these children who um, seem to know things um, that is, uh, seem to be inexplicable how they should know these things. Now, why is reincarnation <clears throat> a topic which is a very um, therapeutic topic um, to understand? And that is because everybody has questions in this world. Why do righteous people suffer? Why is it that there are children who die young or who, have, who are miscarried? There are so many questions that we have on the ways of Hashem that this idea of reincarnation, which we have just shown is a very mainstream Jewish idea, this can be very helpful for us to find some sort of closure at the right time and to find some sort of um, um, uh, feeling of peace of mind when difficult things happen. Now, before I go into explain this, I must say that one should never go to a person who is in in mourning and say, don't worry, it's just because they were reincarnated from a previous lifetime, it's all wonderful for them. One has to have a great deal of sensitivity, of course, and um, one must be very, very cautious in sharing these ideas, because if these ideas are said at the right time, they can be very cathartic, they can be very comforting. If they're said at the wrong time, it could be a, a, a very evil to say these things to people when they are not ready to hear them. But this is um, an idea which reincarnation explains. Now, again, the Nishmas Chaim that we mentioned before of Manasseh ben Israel, he discusses a Gomorrah which speaks about why it is that the righteous suffer. And it says that sometimes Tzadik Varalo, a Tzadik, a righteous person who evil things happen to him, is a Tzadik ben Rosha, is a Tzadik who is the son of an evil person. And of course, everybody asks, how do we understand this Gomorrah? We know Hashem does not punish the children for the sins of their ancestors. So what does it mean, a tzaddik ben Rosha, a righteous person, the son of an evil person, that they are someone who has difficulties in this world? So Manasseh ben Israel explains that tzaddik ben Rosha does not mean a righteous person, the son of a wicked person. Rather, what it means is it's a righteous person who in a previous lifetime um, was a wicked person. And it doesn't mean a literal son over here. Sadiq ben Roshon means somebody who in a previous lifetime was wicked. And that's why in this lifetime, despite the fact that they are righteous, sometimes they have to undergo um, these difficulties. Um, also, this can uh, uh, be a, a, a help us to understand why it is that children die young. Rahmono litzlon, may God save everybody from these tragedies or why there are miscarriages in the world. Sometimes a miscarriage is to be understood as it's a soul that just needed to come back into the world just for the final, final piece of um, uh, suffering to, that it should go through this in order to achieve the highest levels um, in the world to come. Um, uh, also, um, there, there is a great rabbi here in England, Rabbi Rom Gurovitz, the Gateshead Rosh Hashiva. 
he, as well as many other of the great Torah leaders, they would stand up when there would be autistic children um, or, or children who are, who are physically and mentally uh, disabled um, and they are uh, children who are, can't do anything, these great ra rabbis would stand up in their presence because they feel I am in the presence of a great and lofty soul who almost, almost perfected everything. They only need to come back in the world just to exist here. They don't even need to do any mitzvahs or avoid any averus because they are on such a high level. So these um, ideas, uh, um, they, um, the idea of, of, uh, child, of, of children uh, knowing things um, that is uh, inexplicable um, and why bad things happen to good people and why sometimes there are children um, who have these difficulties um, uh, are also explained by this uh, idea of reincarnation. Now, do you know who, um, next point, do we know who we are a reincarnation of? Well, unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, we do not. Um, the Sefer Hasidim says that a person is not aware of previous reincarnations. This is not something which um, we know about at all. And Hashem wants us to do the best that we can with the strengths and weaknesses, with the milus and chesreinus which we have. He wants us to be tomim tia em Hashem alaykecho. He wants us to be open and straightforward and posh it, um, and, and not to be thinking, well, maybe I'm a reincarnation of this or maybe that. He wants us to try and do the best that we can with what we've got. So we don't, we're not aware in almost all circumstances of our previous um, incarnations. However, as we mentioned beforehand with the story of the Baal Shem Tov that we um, opened up with, um, um, our previous incarnation certainly impacts on our current um, situations. Um, there's a halachic idea over here as well. Um, and and um, we'll start um, to try and bring things back together. Um, in the halacha, it says in Masech Ta Avedo Zoro, Tafiutes, Omar Rebbe, Ein Odom Loi Mateira, Ela Bamokam Shalibay Chofetz. Mimokam Shalibay Chofetz. A person, when they learn Taira, it should be Taira that they enjoy, that their heart has a desire for. As it says, Shenemar in Tehillim, that the Torah of Hashem should be his delight. He should learn the Torah of Hashem that delights him. Now, that is the Gemara in Masech Tavayda Zorah. We're supposed to try, we need to try and learn all areas of Torah, but particularly the area, there are certain areas that certain people really are interested in. So um, the Arizal explains, the great Kabbalist, that why is it that I may have one particular area in Halacha that I love learning. With me, it's actually halacha. I find that I get a particular enjoyment from learning halacha. For some other people, it's chumish. For some other people, it's mishnayas. Some other people, it's the Kabbalistic things. Every, we all have to try and learn a bit of everything, um, hopefully a lot of everything. But we have certain predispositions, certain things that we have a particular connection to. So, um, so why is it that there are these certain things that we feel predisposed to. So the Arizal says um, in Sefer Gulgulim um, that, that the reason is because in a previous lifetime, these were bits that we have not learned yet. In a previous lifetime, we managed to perfect other areas, but we did not yet manage to perfect this area. So therefore, we are um, uh, in, in this lifetime, there are certain areas that we really need to focus on. If you enjoy it, learn as much as you can, because this was an area that we had not managed to perfect last time um, we were here. Um, uh, many, uh, of course, people have heard of one of the great, great Torah commentators of all time called the al -Sheikh. The al -Sheikh, again, lived in Tzafas um, at the same time as the Arizal in the 1500s. And the al -Sheikh asked the Arizal if he should learn Kabbalah if he should learn mysticism. And the Arizal said to him, no, 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 you've already mastered that last time you were here. Now you need to work on Chumash. And in fact, we know that he became one of the greatest Torah um, commentators. As well as that, when it comes to certain mitzvahs, the Gemara says in Shabbos Kufiud Ches that 
um, that there are certain people who have certain connections with a particular mitzvah. Now, of course, we have to keep all the mitzvahs, but sometimes it could be the certain mitzvah. There's a mitzvah that I feel so strongly about and connected to, to fill in Shabbos, Kashrus, other certain areas. So, um, so the Gemara says, Amalei Rav Yosef, Rav Yosef Breidorova, Avuch b'may Zohir Tzfei. What was your father, um, Rava, particularly careful with? Amalei b'tzitzis. He was particularly careful with the mitzvah of tzitzis. Now, the Arizal says that that these mitzvahs that we have a partic- we're particularly drawn to, or we find particularly difficult. These are the mitzvahs which we especially need to put effort in um, because of a reason from a previous lifetime um, um, where we need to correct certain things that happened in a previous lifetime. So either we feel very drawn to a mitzvah or we actually feel that we always feel challenged in this area. That's a mitzvah um, that we need to focus on. Okay, now coming back to what we started off with, the mitzvah of Yibum. Now, both the Ramban and Rabbeinu Bachai, two of the early Torah commentators, the Rishonim, they both explain the mitzvah of Yibum um, um, using this concept of reincarnation. So um, let us discuss this mitzvah of Yibum. If a, uh, a man dies and he has left no children, so then um, the wife originally was supposed to marry the deceased person's brother. And if um, they didn't, so then there was a shoe removing ceremony called Chalitza. Now, of course, whichever one is done, this is always a great tragedy. There's been a a couple, a husband who has died um, and uh, there has been a widow left. So um, we, of course, have to try and empathize emotionally with the situation. But we're going to be speaking about it a little bit surgically um, um, uh, today, just to try and understand the ideas. Um, so she she marries the deceased's brother. In the case of Rus, before um, in, in the early generations, uh, it would be even a family relative, even if it's not the brother. After that, it would only be um, the brother. If she doesn't, if a person doesn't, then there's a shoe removing ceremony. Say the Ramban and Rabbeinu Bachai. The, the idea of this is that this um, person has unfinished business, and it is a, a tsar for them, a pain for them, that um, they did not have the opportunity um, to uh, leave descendants in this world. And so, by if she is of marriageable age, uh, the wife uh, having a child with the relative allows the deceased person to be reincarnated and come back down to the world. And that is a great source of comfort um, for the soul of the deceased, that now the soul is able to come back down into the world and live on. Now, and that is the idea of Yibum. Why is it that if Yibum is not done, there is a shoe removing ceremony? Because in Kabbalistic literature, the shoe is um, symbolizes the person's body, just like your shoe just contains the lowest part of you, so too your body contains the lowest parts of your in- incredible soul. And, um, and that's why the shoe is actually a reference to a body. Um, so um, so um, if this person was, if they didn't get married and do yibum, so then there's a shoe removing ceremony as though to say, you're not allowing this person's body to come back here into the world. And that is also a slight tick on that's also beneficial for the soul of the, of the deceased. Um, so um, what we have over here is the fascinating idea that, um, that the idea of reincarnation is the source of what's going on in, um, in this Torah topic of Yibum and Chalitza. Um, with this, we can now go back to the posuk that we had started with um, when we are told that when Rus has a child with Boaz, um, that they said, Yulad ben Lenoomi, a child has been born to Naomi. And we said, what are you talking about? This child is not a relative of Naomi at all. It is Naomi's daughter-in-law, Rus, who's marrying some distant cousin, Boaz. But this has nothing to do with Naomi. Now we're saying, even if physic, with physical genetics, um, we cannot see any 
um, of the DNA, which is similar to Naomi's. However, the spiritual genetics, this child is actually, um, this child of Rus, which would be called Oved, is the reincarnation of the son of Naomi, Machlon, who had died um, and who had originally been married to Rus. And therefore, literally, a child has been born to Naomi because Machlon now has the opportunity to be reincarnated uh, into the world. What I take away um, from the discussion which we have had um, today, um, uh, firstly, is this helps us to understand all of these Torah topics. Um, this also helps us to understand slightly um, the ways of Hashem and to, and to see the mechanism of how he runs the world. It gives us a deeper um, understanding um, and also helps us to motivate us that we don't want to have to come back here again. And therefore, we have to try and make the most of the lives that we have and try and do as many good deeds as possible in the world and to try and maximize our potential. And, um, and certainly, as I close, um, I see all of you and I see all of you who are really, truly using this time uh, during Corona to try and learn things and to try and make the most of some of the most incredible rabbis in the world and also some grade B or C rabbis maybe. But I can see that you're all um, really making the most of the opportunities that you have. And therefore, it's uh, we should please God continue. Mechayel el choyel from strength to strength, fixing all that needs to be fixed, maximizing all of the potential that we have. And we should continue to share many simchas that dance together and see all of our loved ones again at the time of the Geula, of the redemption and of Trias HaMesim, the resurrection. We should all share many, many simchas, Be'ez Hashem, and special, if, I, if you don't mind, kisses to all of the family members uh, who I can see from around the world who've also uh, joined in. Thank you very, very much. Um, and really, every bracha, thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Rabbi Tugotaft, from all the all the listeners. We very enjoyed it, and we hope to see you in the near future again. Thank you very uh, much. Can you rod saying hello? Otherwise, okay. tomorrow morning in Jerusalem. Oh, man, that's the goal. Thank you so much. Thank you, Skoya. Very interesting. Yes. Hello. hello. Thank you very, very much. Great to see you, Shmuli. Thank you. And he hello, Paula, and hello, Levi. So nice to see you all. <laughs> Wonderful. Regards to Shoshana and the, and the family, and Blanche, of course. Thank you so much. I will do. Thank you very, very much. See you all soon. See you all soon. Okay. God bless, and have a lovely Bye. Yomta. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you so much. Ja. Ah, het is klaar. Mooi verhaal. Prachtig. Dat is goed gedaan. Dat is zo. Ja, ik moet nog even bijkomen.